Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, everybody. Uh, welcome to this lecture on uh, 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 sponsored by WISE and, uh, and the initiative Affordable Energy for Humanity. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure having you here. It's a pleasure having uh, Dr. Claudio Vergara uh, making this presentation. He's a Chilean engineer, uh, and currently he's a postdoctoral fellow at MIT, uh, the Energy Insti Initiative at MIT. Uh, he, he got his, his PhD degree in 2005 from Porto University uh, and had several estates at MIT and Comillas University uh, in Madrid. Uh, with a dissertation on model, models for electromechanical storage in power systems. Electrochemical. Oh, pardon me, electrochemical, sorry. <laughs> My sight fails me. Uh, as a researcher at the Universidad de Chile, he was a lead, of, uh, lead developer of one of the first uh, fully future and controlled isolated microgrids in 2010 in the Atacama Desert. In fact, I had the opportunity to visit that, uh, that microgrid and, and it's used uh, now and before as an example of a fully autonomous microgrid where the man site management, the com community participates. So it's really a wonderful piece of work and, and is used as an example throughout the world how to develop these microgrids, remote microgrids. Since 2012, his research has, co has focused on the determination of the value of distributed energy resources for both modern power systems, such as the large interconnected grids in Europe and North America, as well as the uh, small or incipient ones emerging from the expansion of access to electricity. Dr. Vergara has uh, has also taught or is, teach, has teach, is teaching courses and simulation and, this, in simulation and decision support models for electric power systems offered by MIT's Institute for Data Systems and Society. So welcome, Claudio. The okay. floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Claudio, for the introduction and for, for inviting me here. I really like to, to talk about this topic. It's, it's one of these rare occasions when you can do something that you believe in and that is also at the same time really fun. Uh, I started working on this when I was in Chile. And I had, for my background is in electrical engineering, I was working on solar vehicles, some, something like solar panels also, developing electronics for maximum power point trackers. And became interested in the possibility of building a power system from the bottom up, like building a power system from scratch. So what happens if you have something like the Haiti earthquake and you have to just get this to work again? That requires that you understand all the like, dynamics and economics and steady state and, and, and different aspects of power systems. So that's why I, I started working on this project for a location in Chile, where we did a, a demonstration for a village of around like 150 uh, houses. And it was pretty much of a, like a playground for control and, and, and optimal optimization algorithms. It was successful, it worked. Then I went to work with a group in, in Portugal, as, as Claudia was mentioning, that they were leading the European efforts on microgrids and, and electric vehicle in, uh, integrations. And battery was a key aspect there. So what battery was perhaps the least, uh, the less understood uh, component. So I tried to improve the models in, 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 in batteries. And now more recently, I've been trying to go like, beyond my enthusiasm for the technical solutions and try to understand what is the value of these different technologies. Because I realized that even when the, the technical problem was a really interesting problem, if you want to have really an impact in the world in, like, big, in these big problems, you need, to, you need to understand it in the broader context. How people are going to use it, what this is substituting, also what are your long-term objectives, how this is going to have to change, and so on. So now we work at the MIT Energy Initiative, which is an organization within MIT, to which I think that is roughly 60% of MIT faculty is associated. MIT has around 1,000 professors, so roughly like 600 professors have some relationship with the MIT Energy Initiative. And part of the MIT Energy Initiative, or very, that works in very close relationship with it, is the Tata Center for Technology and Design which started with a large donation, a gift, from the Tata Trust. So Tata are one of the, like, the largest companies in, in India. And they were interested in having researchers with students working on problems that were relevant to India. 
So it's been around like it's five years since the center started, and we are working in these in these six topics. So you can see that energy is, is only one of them, but all these are problems are really big in in India. So the environment, like pollution in cities like Delhi, is really unbelievable for the ones of you who have who have been there. Uh, of course, agriculture is is a is a really large country, and rural areas are really extensive. The cities are getting like more and more crowded, and so you need a lot of, of research around, like, like for example, waste management, transportation systems. Then we have like water, which is also probably linked to energy and to agriculture. We are studying this in combination. For example, in water, you have water pumping, which is related to agriculture, which is related to energy. So you, to pump water, you need to feed the pump with something. The traditional way is with diesel. There's some experiments now trying to link it, demonstration more than experiments, linking that with solar. You also have the link between energy and environment and energy and health. So right now, kerosene is used extensively for indoor lighting, which has important health consequences. So the group where I work in is, is energy, and we are looking at access. So how can we help give access to like nearly 400 million people in India who have either like no access or really, really poor access to electricity. This is a theme that immediately works with me in, in electricity access. About two thirds of them work in planning and simulation models and the others work on development of technologies that can help electricity scale up. Uh, so Dr. Rob Stoner is the director of data center uh, professors Ignacio Perez Arriaga and Rajiv Ram are, there, are the two lead PIs at MIT. Uh, we have like two research <laughs> staffs in the group, uh, Riza Matia and, and myself. A number that varies, but is, is usually around like 10 grad students. And we, the two generations of students have already graduated from, from our group, have done thesis in this, in this topic. And what we have been trying to do is to leverage an existing context of both MIT and the, and the TATAs to establish connections that allow us to first decide which research is the relevant research, and second, to how to deliver that research in the form of advice or products that can have, can have impact. So for example, with, with Iberdrola and Enel, we have been looking at opportunities even beyond India in, in Africa, in particular in, in Kenya, Rwanda. We recently started working with GIZ, which is a German cooperation agency, and they have analysis projects going on right now in, in Uganda and Rwanda. These companies here are ones that we are, have started working with, like Selco is Solar Electric Light Co. It's an India company that started just distributing solar home systems. Tata Urji is a micro developer. General Electric, they are developing some solutions for, for microgrids, like microgrid in a box kind of type of systems. And Tata Consulting Services have been helping us to organize and validate the data we are getting from the field, which hasn't been, hasn't been an easy task. Um, and also, this is a, a Spanish uh, company, an, an NGO called Energia Sin Fronteras, Energy Without Borders. And they are, are doing pilots in different, in different parts of the world around electrification. And we're working in Rwanda with the Belgian Development Agency, seeing if it makes sense that some of our methods could be used by planners in Rwanda to improve the coordination between the expansion of the conventional electric grid and off-grid solutions. So I wanted to start just with some thoughts here. Uh, they are not really like well organized, but something that, that I thought was, in, was good to mention at the beginning. So for example, the fact that this is a, this is a big challenge. So it's big uh, with like any number you want to put there. So we are talking about like around 1.2 US billion, so 1,200 million people in the world that need either initial access or significant improvements in access to electricity, which you can translate like roughly into 300 million households. If you use a number that people sometimes quote that is roughly uh, $1,000 per connection per household. We're talking about around 10 to 11, six times 10 to 11 in CAPEX, so that's capital expenditures, 
to connect them to the grid. And if you take into account a reference of like 1,000 kilowatt hours per person per year, that means roughly 2 times 10 to 11 in OPEX. That's fuel, maintenance, and, and so on. It's clear that there is not enough money. We have tight government budgets. They have many different priorities, roads, health, agriculture, poverty. They have low grade rating, so the government cannot borrow money to address these problems at the, at the interest rates that we are used to in the developed world. There is a potential conflict that I'm going to talk about later, which is the entrepreneur grid extension risk. There, is a, there can be an, an, an entrepreneur who goes and builds an off-grid site, but since the, the most immediate risk is that the government is going to decide to extend the grid to a village, they have to record the investment really quickly, which means that they are looking at maybe two years, five years payback periods, which is translated into really high cost of electricity. That's the only way that they can get access to financing that has interest rates that are, that are reasonable. And also, the financial structure of, of, of India and Africa is not as solid as here. So access to banks and intermediaries is a problem. Uh, a very important problem that we have found, which in hindsight is like self-evident, is that there is not enough information. It's not just about that you, if you had this money, you wouldn't really know how to spend that money. Because you don't know where the houses are, you don't know how much people can pay, you don't know which appliances people would have. So when you're looking at like macro numbers, picking the technology, picking where to go, and deciding between conventional solutions like, like grid extension, and, and off-grid solutions is, is, is difficult. There is emerging technologies, for example, as a consequence of the option of PV in the developed world, the cost of PV and, and storage have decreased. We have more and more options for metering and automation. There have been a number of startups in the developing world around metering. But this is like the currently where there is mo mo the most progress in terms of technology. In terms of the more like power management equipment. Uh, the things that are being used are coming from other applications in the developed world. So there's still a few companies only developing uh, inverters that are catered for these applications, protections that are catered for these applications, and so on. Which means that if you want to have a reasonable amount of control over these grids, you're looking at equipment which is used for, for the industry, which is really expensive. There is no, no, not a, like a middle ground, which, but is, is being developed nevertheless. We have lots of smart people and large corporations working on it. Facebook, like last month announced, or a couple of months ago, announced the initiative to, to work seriously on this. Google's working on this. We have large corporations like the ones we are working with, like Enel, who are looking at this problem. We have the World Bank looking at this problem. The Inter-American Inter Development Bank looking at this problem. International Monetary Fund. and. All the cooperation agencies for the, of, that work in, in Africa, for example, USAID, uh, GIZ, BTC, putting a lot of thinking and, and money into this problem. Finally, one, one thing that one has to keep in mind is that interconnected power systems are, are a great invention. Right now, our intuition is that except for extremely isolated villages, in the mid-long term, extending the grid is going to be the most, is, is the most economic solution. So if you could wire up, wire up. Some villages are going to be really like far away at the top of mountain. For those, microgrids will be a solution for, for longer time. But we have seen that as demand grows, the grid prevail as the dominant solution, which is what explains the success of European uh, power systems North American power systems and in all the other parts of the world when, where we have those solutions. So with this in mind, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about today, so which is a couple of things. So the first is a conceptual framework to support these discussions about access. Then some comments on efforts we have been doing around supply side solutions. And finally, and this is going to be most of the presentation, is about the, our reference electrification model, which is a, is a planning tool that we can use for many things. One of them is to decide 
when the grid is a better option than off-grid or vice versa. We are not pro-grid, we are not pro-micro-grid, we're just trying to establish some sort of advanced calculator that can help facilitate conversations. So when people are, yeah. So uh, if I could just comment on the previous slide, the last bit about the grid. Uh, in India, the biggest problem is that farmers get electricity for free. So there has, there is no money to I'll get to your point, but it's a combination of two things. So I, at first, the situation you're describing is accurate, is what we see when we go to rural areas in India. And the combination of two things is, one, that we are talking about this from a technical, techno-economical point of view. So there is a number of considerations that explain why the reliability of the grid in India is, is the way it is. And, and the second one is about the structure of incentives that the utilities have. So they, there was a reform last year where the credit worthiness of, that is, so the credit worthiness of utilities are, is expected to increase, which is going to solve like the perennial debt that they have that was ever increasing. And in the beginning, off-grid solution is something that we clearly see as part of the way out of the problem. But when you look at this from the point of view of just pure like techno-economical solutions, economies of the scale in the grid are so strong <coughs> That that's why also thinking about grid defection in, in our modern systems, like when uh, you see examples of places, I think especially in Europe, where people are thinking seriously about going off-grid, those initiatives are responding to most of the times skewed incentives rather than to sound economics. And we see that the same, the same way of reasoning can help us see why off-grid solutions in many countries are, are transitory. Transitory could be 50 years, right? We have to like increase demand, also strengthen the grid. I'm gonna to touch on those points. Right. Okay, so maybe I'll ask my question later, but uh, I, I disagree. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, first of all, this is, this is my personal opinion based on the intuition I built working with models and talking to people there. But the other people from my group may disagree with what I'm saying right now. Um, Okay, so it's, so it's the framework, then the supply side, and finally the, the reference electrification model, and then some comments on research that is, that is right now ongoing. I welcome any disagreement throughout the, throughout the presentation, so just feel free to jump. Yeah. So in part, one of the reasons I'm coming here is for people to tell me that what I'm saying doesn't make sense, so I can learn something from that. So the starting point here is what do we mean by access? And, and that has like different meanings like for different people. So for example, the, here you have some projections for different developed countries for, for different years. So for, for, the, for the global per capita electricity consumption map to consumptions of countries in, the, in different years. So the low projection for 2035 is around 4,000 kilowatt hours per person year. IEA's definition of energy access is a couple of hundred kilowatt hours per person per year. So one thing here is that this is not obviously wrong. To decide whether it is right or it is wrong, one thing that we need to take into account is what are the opportunities that the world is losing because of not having this number be higher than that. I understand this problem in terms of like three major understanding challenges. So the first one is to understand the demand side related to which appliances people may own, what is the impact of owning those appliances and being able to use them in, on economic development, available income, substitutes like kerosene, for example, or diesel, access to financing. So this is going to 
give you a curve that tells you if people were able to consume, they would translate that consumption into value. And, and value is really what we want to create. So selling kilo hours or have people consume kilo hours doesn't have a value in itself. The second side is the supply side. We want to have something that allows us to understand what is the best electrification mode. I'm going to explain which are the electrification modes that we are considering. Uh, how to design systems, how to operate those systems, and also again like financing and deciding what are the, business, the best business models to operate those systems. At the center of this challenge to understand is the planning, is the planning and regulation challenge, which is what is going to set the stage for efficient decisions on the side of different agents. So if you provide with a regulatory framework that incentivizes low risk investment in off-grid technologies, then entrepreneurs are going to come, use available funds, get, get the, uh, the rest of the money, and install those systems. If you provide, um, if you don't provide those incentives, and for example, you have this risk that the grid may, may get to a place at, at any time, then entrepreneurs are not going to do that. You need to take into account that there is limited budget, that when you connect people to the grid, they are going to impact the quality of the existing grid. So it's not just, if you have a country that has 20% electrification rate, and you want to increase that to 50%, and you assume that the existing grid will just take it, and that the existing generators will just take it, you are, you're, you're wrong, and you're going to see that uh, the rolling blackouts are going to be a, a thing of, of every day. Standards are important, and how to design subsidies is also very important. So as I, I was talking about the possibility of creating value with consumption, and, and this, is, this helps me visualize what we are talking about here. I had the tendency to think that demand growth was a growth in, for example, kilowatt, kilowatt hour. I think that a better way of understanding that is that demand growth means that your possibilities to create value with electricity expand, which means that for the same price, you would be willing to spend more of your income in electricity because that is valuable to you. So what we have here is a curve where the, the horizontal axis is energy units, and I'm expressing value in terms of money. So in my interpretation, demand in year one means the blue demand curve. And there is, there is one important feature of this curve, which is that it has decreasing marginal returns. <clears throat> so that the first use, units of electricity that you consume are really valuable for you, which is you have lights, you may charge your cell phone. The last units of electricity that you consume, you wouldn't be willing to pay as much for them. For example, your TV or, or using a fan yeah, that is not that hot. As your income or your uses of electricity changes, maybe you have like cultural changes in between, the relationship between energy consumption and value will change. When we think about demand for the situations we are, we are looking at, this is the question that we start asking ourselves. So what would people demand if they had access to electricity? So here's, here's a, an, an example of, of appliances. This is coming from the uh, typical appliances from the National Sample Survey in, in India, where they sample a number of households and they ask questions about what appliances they, they currently own. The most prevalent appliances are like mobile phones, fans, televisions, and radios. So and when we build demand models, we, we, we take into account that buildings will have this at the micro level. Then we have to relate this information to what we're seeing at the substation. So these books here are the electricity consumption log that you see in a substation in the state of Bihar, in, this, in the district of Vaishali. So you go there, and the operator, every hour, writes down what was the consumption on, a, on each one of the feeders. And that gives you a lot of interesting information. For example, for which fraction of the time the feeder was actually available. And of course, the, the, the magnitudes of consumption there. So now, I, I was telling before that I want to understand this relationship between demand and supply to be able to formulate the planning problem. So what I have here is just like the most basic microeconomics. Yep. I have, here, I have, I have the lights here. But this is separate. Okay. Right. Um, 
So here I have, this is the, the, the basic microeconomic analysis. The demand curve I already explained, so it comes from the value that the user assigns to the final uses of electricity. No, no, this is, this is an abs, this is an abs, this is just, it's just to explain the concept. It's just to explain the concept. It's just, um, I want to make a point with this, with these curves. Um, assume that there is a value curve that has decreasing marginal returns, which is a, it's a rational assumption for the reasons that I was explaining before. What you see when you build the supply, the cost curve for supplying that electricity, you find economies of scale. For example, that, that supplying one building is per unit more expensive than supplying 100 buildings, or that supplying a small demand in one building is per unit more expensive than supplying a large demand in one building. This has to do with economies of scale in equipment, also with lumpiness. For example, the minimum size of your solar panel you can buy is not infinitely small. The same with the batteries. They come in modules. You buy an inverter. They have a, they have a certain time. So with this economies of scale effect is something that we see in power systems all the time. When you build large, it comes cheaper in a, in a per unit basis. So what is, now the question that I ask is like, what is the efficient level of consumption? And the efficient level of consumption from the microeconomic point of view is when the marginal value equals the marginal cost. Because that means that if you consume the next unit, it's going to cost you more than the extra value you're getting from that unit. Yeah, that's a very good observation. We have a, we have a case, for example, I know the case of the Chilean mining industry. Um, and the, the price of electricity in Chile was relatively expensive. It is currently expensive. Maybe you see prices of like $150, $200 per megawatt hour. Um, and when the price of copper went down, the value of that economic activity did not even justify to pay for the electricity to go from copper concentrate to copper. So it's true that you enable activities that are really valuable, but since you are in a, in a productive process where all that like, eats from your margin, if you are in a company that's operating efficiently, your willingness to pay for electricity will be lower than if someone is going to turn your lights off. So if, you are, if, if, you, if you're in the dark, you are willing to pay $1 per kilowatt hour for not being in the dark. But if you're hot, you're maybe willing to pay 20 cents per kilowatt hour to be able to use your fan. If you're watching TV, maybe you're willing to pay 15 cents per kilowatt hour to watch TV. That's why the, the, the later uses are marginally less valuable when this curve saturates. Does that make, does it make sense? Yeah, I guess that's, as you said, like in terms of maybe different ways of looking at it. So when you're looking at proactive uses, you also need like many other inputs to, yes. to, to produce, to manufacture something you need labor input and you need materials. Electricity is, is, is one part of that. But uh, the cost curve would be exponential too? No linear? The cost curve, so this is absolute cost. It, it, it has an asymptote when you exhausted all the economies of the scale. So it's like in, in, in large scale power systems, meeting one extra unit of demand is the same as meeting the extra unit of demand if you had like one gigawatt more installed in your power system. So, the, so he, if you're here, you are in a, in a system that has exhausted, the you already depleted your economies of the scale. So you're not getting gains from growing. This is going to be important when I explain the, the model, how you group things. Like the drivers for grouping things and for building larger systems are coming from these, from the, maybe the is not the best, but here, there is a higher slope than here. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. So it, it is, it it's like a logarithmic. It's a, it's a, the, so here's where you find the, the optimal point. In this case, is for, so you have an optimal level of consumption, which means that if you build a system that is larger than that, you're likely to under recover because people will not be able, will not be willing to pay for the cost of providing electricity at, the, uh, at that level. So if you, if the optimal layer of consumption is 45, 
and you decide to build a system that can give them 100, you are going to need to subsidize because there is no value, enough value being created by that extra supply to, to pay for that cost. The, the, the thing to remember is that when you are deciding about buying the next unit of electricity, the cost of that has to be less than the extra value that you obtain from consuming that unit of electricity. And, and, that's, where you, and that's where you stop, that's your efficient point. Um, someone is not buying what I'm saying. It's good. It's okay. So the next one I'm, I'm showing now for the second demand curve, a displacement in the demand curve app, so you look at, the, at this axis, um, is going to result in that the new intersection point is 63, which means that from the societal point of view, it is optimal to increase the amount of supply. But it wouldn't be optimal to increase the amount of supply if you're expecting that the demand curve will remain like this. That translated into something more concrete means that if you have buildings that can afford or that will get value from two lights and a cell phone charger, building a system that can provide 24 seven, five kilowatt ability to consume electricity is, is not efficient. What will happen there is that the utility will not even be able to record the cost of the transformer and the cost of the wires that are associated to that project, especially if the village is, is, is very far away. So the way we're visualizing this is in terms of like climbing an energy access ladder where we, we are trying to see ways to design a sequence where you're catering to the existing situation. So we want people to be able to consume and afford the uses of electricity that we have now, but there, there is some dynamics that we cannot neglect, which is that you give access to a certain amount of supply, you need to give access to enough supply so that they can use that to grow, to improve their quality of, of living, and also to have some proactive uses. And then after some time, then demand grows and your new optimal level of supply is different. If this happens very quickly, if you're expecting that when you give people a small amount of supply, their demand is going to grow in, in three years to this level, you take that into account and maybe the best solution is to just go ahead and build a grid extension. If you think that it's going to take maybe more time, you can design something that is a grid compatible microgrid, which is a, a microgrid that is ready to be connected to the grid so that when the grid comes, it becomes a distributed energy resource and can keep adding value to a larger power system. One problem from the supply side, and it's related to what you were referring to, is, is, the, is in India, the utilities path to bankruptcy. So the case you were describing was even worse than the case that I'm depicting uh, here. So in this case, I have a utility who buys 100 megawatt hours at, from, whole, from the wholesale market or from, it's not market, from, from the transmission system at, for example, $80 per megawatt hour. But there is a regulated tariff that makes them have to sell this at $50 per megawatt hour because of political reasons. And also technical plus non-technical losses. Non-technical losses is people consuming electricity and not paying for it. And technical losses is, well, losses. Uh, resistive losses. Around, so you lose around 40 in technical plus non-technical losses. You have to sell cheaper, which means that every megawatt hour that you deliver is a loss. In the case of agricultural load, agricultural load doesn't even pay anything in many cases. And the government is supposed to compensate for that in some way, but that has not been happening. So that leads to a crisis on the utility side that is turned into basically rolling blackouts. So they decide to like give six hours of electricity to this fear here, then six hours here, and then I cut this other fear when the price is, is, is really high, and so on. This is what is preventing grid extension in many parts of the world to be the preferred solution. And that's why currently, for the, for the current situation, off-grid solutions are, are, are a very good uh, option. We have some signs of lack of coordination between those two sides, the grid side and the entrepreneurial side, as I was mentioning before. For example, there's many entrepreneurs who are taking advantage of this, here this is really steep, so people are willing to pay $1 per kilowatt hour. 
and, and you know that you can pr it is possible to produce energy at one dollar per kilowatt hour with diesel, with even. So some entrepreneurs have started striking deals with, with users, selling electricity pretty expensive. And also with technical solutions that are not scalable and cannot be eventually connected to the grid. I'm going to show you an example of one of those. So this does not enable development and hence does not increase the options for consumers to get out of poverty. You are limiting them from the supply side. So it would be, in this case, it, it would be operating here, where you're charging a lot, you're under the optimal level of supply, and that doesn't uh, help the users to grow. This creates risk for the investors, because as I, as I mentioned before, their assets may, might be stranded if the connection becomes an option for the consumers. And it makes it likely that whatever generation was there was going to be completely replaced by the grid. So this is an example of one of those solutions. There is like a, a single solar panel and battery for an entire village. The trees are used as poles. And the grid is like 200 meters from, from where this picture was taken. The grid is like 200 meters from there. This is what is, uh, people call to be like under the grid. It's not off grid, it's not on grid, it's under the grid. And this is a situation that you see in many, many places in India. Right. So the utility is, doesn't want to connect anybody because of this. They are losing money for everyone they connect. So if they can escape from the possibility of connecting more people, they will. Who set up this panel then? This is a company, I think this company is called Meragao. They set up very- They just gave the panel. They just go there and they say, I sell you electricity for this price per month. It's usually, I think it's like $2 per month fixed payment. You can have- You cannot do that because it's a regulated The utility can strike an independent deal? Right, it's a, it's a regulated it's a business. They they so if the, if the utility wants to electrify them, it has to go with the wires and connect them. Yeah, but they, they cannot offer them a, a, a deal, like, well, I'll connect you for so much. So. Right, no, it's, it's all based on regulated tariffs. Um, so there has been growing inter interest in how to make those systems better, these, these off-grid systems. So right now, they include microgrids and solar home systems. So solar home systems is one system per building. And microgrids are several buildings connected maybe to one or more sources of generation. They could be cost effective. This, is, this was the starting hypothesis of the model where demand is dispersed enough or far away from the grid enough and where grid service is poor. If you have a grid that is close and is good, you are going to want to go for the grid. Uh, and one important challenge here is that this is not well integrated into electrification planning. So when, when the, the government decides to electrify a certain district, they don't have the ability to combine the two solutions. So the government will just do grid. And then entrepreneurs will find places where it is unlikely that the grid will get and will do solutions there. So the, I'm not going to spend so much time on this, on this image, but the, the important thing here is these figures on the left. We have in the center the, the four main electrification modes. One is Pico power lighting systems. So this is sometimes like solar lanterns or very small solar panels. Standalone solar systems that have like larger battery and a, and a solar panel, microgrids and, and grid extensions. So here you see the dramatic effect of the economies of the scale. So in Pico systems, the cost per kilowatt hour is, is really high. And then it goes down when you go to the grid, as I was explaining before. And some, some fears here that are useful for, for reference. For example, this is the cost for mobile phone charging based on a fee. So you can, in some places, you can take your mobile phone and get it charged in, in a certain place. Um, and this is the cost of lighting your house based on fuel, like in, in kerosene. I can, I can put this slide somewhere if someone wants it, but a, this is a reference, this is a paper um, in nature. So now I'm going to talk about what we have been doing at MIT to help with the supply side. 
And one of the ideas was this concept of the U-Link. This was a, the, the first attempt to help the scalability problem. The idea here is that people could build microgrids themselves, making it easier for them to acquire the components separated, and then building a grid where they could trade electricity. So the concept is like fairly advanced, even for, the, for more power systems. But it was turned into a, a functioning box, which is a DC-AC converter. There is like two types of DC-AC converters, ones that are installed in generation sites, and another ones that are installed in user sites. One thing that I really like about this solution is that it can provide differentiated quality of service. So that, that means that you can discover utility functions of consumers. You are going to give better supply to the ones who value electricity. You, you could do that. You could give more supply to the users who value electricity the most. So as this describes, you, it enables sharing. Hypothetically, it would enable an energy marketplace. What we saw in reality is that the concept is, like, is really advanced. This is an example where I think we went too far with the technological concept. And now we're trying to bring that closer to something that is a good trade-off between simplicity and efficiency. So in principle, having a, an energy marketplace would be efficient because then you can, if you buy a solar panel that is too large for your house, you can share the excess electricity with your neighbors. And the one who values the electricity the most is the one who is going to beat the highest price. So that person is going to get electricity. So you are somehow efficiently allocating uh, a limited resource. In practice, so this technology was developed. There were uh, pilots. This, this works. But we, see that we are seeing that the, the gains from having that that technology in place are not going to exceed the extra, extra complexity of the solution. But what was the cost of the system? So here we are looking, so this is a, the, the box. It's still at, at prototype level. It's around 150 watts. And I, and I believe that the cost of the box right now is around like $20 or something like that for the, for the box. One thing that, it, that hasn't been implemented yet, as I here describe some, some functionalities, is low voltage DC. Is modular, which means that more users can come to the microgrid and just, just connect. It will meter power and decide who has to pay whom. It, it takes care of the low level communication and control autonomously, which is like voltage control, for example, load balancing. And there are some functionalities that are still under developing. For example, scheduling, which is like the, like the dispatch algorithm, forecasting and demand, man, demand management and, and payment. So this was, a, I think, it was a, an idea that it, it, in the, the essence of the idea was pointing the right, in the right direction. But because it was uh, in the context of really like cutting edge research on control systems, it had to be, it had to be complicated enough. Um, and it looks like we're going to have to like, try harder and have something that is simpler than this especially from the point of view of what the, how you explain to the user how the system works. Even if the system is completely automatic, if you tell there is a transactive system where this bidding is complicated. How it is different from already available solar motors? So first, this is not an invert, it's a DC network. The idea is that you have, you buy this box, and that box allows you to buy and sell electricity. So you establish some preferences, or like what are your willingness to, to sell and your willingness to pay. And other agents in this marketplace, so this marketplace can be, for example, 20 houses connected between them. And maybe five of those houses have solar panels and someone has a battery. And you establish a marketplace where people can bid for energy or bid for power quality, which means that if one battery or solar panel has excess energy that can be sold to whoever is willing to buy that. So most of the innovation it, it resides in the concept of sharing electricity, not so much in the power electronics here. Although this is, the power electronics is also a PhD thesis or a really super high efficiency DC DC converter there. So it's, it's, a, it's a DC network, that's the fundamental difference, but the, the concept is this energy sharing thing. Um, okay, now I'm going to spend the rest of the time in the, in the middle of the diagram I was showing in the beginning, which is how do we understand and improve planning and regulation? So the starting question here is, 
can we create a method which both, in which both techno-economic considerations and social, political, and regulatory factors can be combined to create a comprehensive regional planning tool? And regional means hundreds of millions of houses. So we are looking at states in India, entire countries like Rwanda or, or Uganda. The, the idea is that this can have some standard formulation in which you can encode quantitative information, qualitative information, social, ecological, and political factors, stakeholder objectives, and then run constrained cost minimization. So it's going to tell you with the quantitative information, technical information that you provide to the model, what is the minimum cost solution? So that is, is supposed to be useful to facilitate conversations around like what is the best thing to do. Our vision is that this is something where many entities can participate and, and serve as a point of exchange of data and also of, of different technological parameters. What it does in, in simple terms is that it just does full designs of electrification options and compares them. I will not spend time here, but we did an analysis of whether it was possible to build a tool that had the characteristics that I mentioned in the beginning, techno-economical, social, and regulatory, and political factors. And we realized that it was not possible, at least with the resources we had at the moment. So we focused on building a very good technical calculator that is just a cost-minimizing cost module that respect some constraints that you can encode. Because many constraints, like for example, I don't want to be connected to a village if they have a different religion. I cannot, I cannot encode that. So there's a list of the different political, regulatory, and technical things. The model supports both large-scale electrification planning and local electrification products. And it produces optimal system designs, selecting the best electrification modes. Selects technologies and sizes, produces system cost and performance ex estimates, and detailed generation and network designs. The high level view of how this works is that first we have to identify the buildings. That starts from satellite imagery and detects individual buildings. Divide the study area into, into regions that we consider independent. Group buildings into clusters. And then for each cluster, we design microgrid, grid extension, and isolated systems and finally determine what is the best electrification mode of those. So basically, we have to group them first, because otherwise, you don't have a unit of analysis. If you say, is it better to have grid or off-grid, the first, the first question, the question that precedes that question is, what is the group of buildings you're talking about? So the, the, grouping, the grouping step is a fundamental step in this program. Um, it's made of a number of functions that fall into these four categories. Inference is a big part of that. We don't know which buildings are electrified. We don't know where are the buildings. We don't know what is the quality of the electricity that exists there. Then there is a stage that formulates the standard problem. And finally, there is a, there is a solver and some analytic, analytical uh, functions at the end. It can be used by policymakers, for example, to see what would be the benefit of improving grid reliability, seeing what would happen if demand grows, uh, if demand goes up. For example, what happens if you want to exclude diesel from the solution? If you say, I want to electrify this place, but zero diesel. What would be the cost of imposing that additional constraint? So this model can tell you about that. Entrepreneurs can use, that to, can use this model to identify locations, have initial engineering designs for, designs for micro layout and generation, and also to assess the financial viability of designs. Manufacturers can use this to come up with what are the best combinations of parameters for a given technology, for example, a battery will have a, sometimes a trade-off between efficiency and lifetime. You, you can simulate the application of the battery into a real, in, into a, an unrealistic off grid system and decide all those parameters. It's an application we're exploring right now. In the first mode, we can analyze, for example, a single village. When you have a single village, you have detailed information about like, where the houses are and what each house is. So usually you just send someone to a field who was with a GPS and marked the location of each one of the houses. In the second mode, we solve the large-scale the large electrification problem. So the first step for the second mode is the building identification step. It starts with satellite imagery, and then we use what is called like convolutional neural networks, which is a, a form of deep learning, which is trained 
with images that are labeled by humans. So we give some people satellite images. They label which areas they consider to be buildings. We give to a computer maybe 20,000 objects that a human recognizes buildings. And then the computer learns some patterns that tell the computer what is a building and what is not a building. So then with that, you can, you can detect that. So this is a brief explanation of this segmentation process. And this is how it works. So this is the uh, data that is labeled by a human. This is ground truth data. Here we have some results of how the algorithm performs. So what you get from here is an area segmentation. And then we need a second algorithm that goes from area segmentation into points. And then these points are the object of the analysis of the rest of the, of the program. So you have some issues with image quality, especially if you download them from Google Maps. So for example, this is a zoom into one village. You can see that the detection is not perfect, but at least in terms of getting the basic layout of the buildings in a, in a certain area, it has proven to be good enough. So when we compare a human detection, run the model, and then do automatic detection and run the model, the differences are not, are not, are not very large. So it's an example for the region of Vaishali of that. And running super short of time, so I'm going to speed up. Um, this is an example of the design that REM, reference electrification model, produced for that specific village. And you can see that the detail of the model reaches every house. So the model contains one function which does generation sizing and another function which does network layout. It can take into account that there is a lake, that there is a hill, geographic uh, features, and, and runs medium voltage, high voltage, and low voltage wires down to the level of every building. This is an example we sold for the entire area of Vaishali, which is a, a case study that we did. One of the problems that we have is to, under, to try to guess who is electrified or is not electrified before we can solve the, solve the, the, the big problem. We're using buffer zones that are also transformers right now and trying to match the number of consumers that the different distribution utilities know are consumers of them. And finally, we formulate the problem just in terms of the non-electrified consumers. Let me skip ahead to, okay, to these. Another thing we have to guess about is load profiles. So what you see here is like a format that summarizes a survey. The survey can be go and ask people what appliances they would have and how they would use them. And this is summarizing appliance ownership and uses in terms of probabilities. So for example, this is saying um, the average number of lights, we have three types of lights here, of lights number two is two. This is the power, everyone has them. In average, they use them five hours per day. And there's some conditions. We are linking these to a weather file, so we can say lights will only be used when it's dark, or we can say the fans will only be used when it's hot, and conditions like that. And that gets turned into a specific expected demand profiles for different types of buildings. So it's different to viewing this for a house than viewing this for a commercial building or government buildings, for example. What I'm showing here is the, is the clustering step. So once you have where the points are, and you have the demand per point, the next step is to group them. And, the, and the, the objective here is to do it without exploring every combination. So we start with all the points. We first create what we call the off-grid clusters, which is how you would group buildings if you knew that the best solution was off-grid. Once we have that, we say, how would you group off-grid clusters if you knew that the best solution was grid extension? So then we have units for comparison. We can take the off-grid cluster and design the best off-grid solution, and take the on-grid cluster and decide the best on-grid solution. The methodology we're using for this is starting from a minimum spanning tree. Because if you start, if you start from here, the different ways in which you could group points is very large. So if you have 600,000 points, in how many ways you can possibly group them? And it's a really, really large number. So what we do is to con constrain this to the minimum spanning tree, which is the, so this is the, what we call it, the Delaunay triangulation, which we use as possible associations between points. 
Then from that, we select a subset of those associations which constitute the, the tree that connects all the dots with minimum length. And then I start asking questions about each specific connection. For example, we have a group here, we have a group here, and then we say, will it make sense to merge them or not? And the trade-off here is the gains in economies of scale from merging from the point of view of generation versus the extra cost of network. When you merge two groups, you have to spend more in network, but per unit of generation, you spend less because you're exploiting economies of scale in, in, in generation. So we start with off-grid clusters, sort inter-cluster lines, which are these lines, in order of length, and finally go deciding about which one of them are economic or not, taking into account economies of scale in generation versus extra cost in network, and arrive to the final clustering groups. Uh, this is an example for the uh, operation algorithm. So for each one of the clusters, when you solve for generation, we simulate an entire year and come up with the best combination of solar panels, diesel generators, and, and batteries for each one of the systems, and that gives us the cost. And for the, for the network, we use an existing, existing distribution planning model. This is called the reference network model. It was developed in Spain to compute the position of transformers and, and, and all the wires. So here, for example, we can see a, a case where there is a grid extension design. This is the existing grid and one grid extension cluster is built around that connection point. The assumption about a grid extension quality is really, we've, we have found it to be really important. So if you, you have that, for example, if you were to electrify this cluster, this entire cluster just with off-grid, the cost would be 118 lakh rupees per year. But then depending on your assumption about the availability of the grid, you can make the decision that the best solution is off-grid or on-grid. So for example, here if we assume that the grid is 100% of the time available, you set for off-grid because this, for on-grid because this is cheaper than this. Now you take into account the cost of non-serve energy associated with a less available grid, you, you decide for the off-grid solution. So as I was mentioning before, we run this in, in Baishali. Just go quickly through this. This is the type of information you get when you go there. It's a paper map with all the lines that we had to then validate with local engineers, digitize it. We had to guess out the electrification status of the, of the buildings. And then we just run some sensitivity analysis. For example, this is the case where you say, if I allow diesel, my solution is to have mostly off-grid solutions. If you don't allow for diesel, the cost for the different micro is going to go up. So then the, the, the best solution in this case is two degree extensions. I'm on time. So this is an example of a web interface that we have that shows the, the results of the model. So you can zoom in here, select the specific uh, grid extension clusters or off-grid clusters, see some metrics for each one of the microgrids. So the model will actually like design every single one of the off-grid systems and give you, give you summaries. We have some preloaded results where you can uh, select sensitivities, for example, on diesel price, and the solution will change accordingly. I will skip through these because we don't have time. But the, this is the only one that I want to mention, is that you, depending on what is your target reliability of your microgrid, you're going to have that at different hours of the day, it is more or less likely that supply will be present, which is also translated into cost figures. Uh, I, won't, I won't stop there. So you can explain to people, for example, if you pay this amount of money, you're going to have a system that will give you 99% reliability, which means that almost every day you're going to have energy every hour of the day. If you want to spend more, you're going to have a system that will fail, at, uh, will fail sometimes. And then the, each village can decide what is the trade-off between cost and, and quality of service that they want to strike. The, your assumption of demand also influences your network design. So for example, if you expect the demand is going to grow, you may want to overbuild your distribution network in the expectation that it will grow because it has really high fixed cost to get started building this. Finally, here is talk. My some remarks on how can we help electricity access scale up faster. So first, uh, scalability requires access which is adequate for the potential value that you can extract from electricity. I think that this is this is very important. So you you can't just say, I want to electrify 400 million people and all of them are going to have 24/7 five kilowatt uh, connection 
for this, you have to develop methods to assess impact of different access to electricity. Demand growth depends on many other factors. For example, if you have access to roads, if you have access to education, that combined with electricity is going to result in, in welfare increases. It is important to coordinate actions performed by regulated, by regulated entities with entrepreneurs to reduce the risk. When demand growth is significant, if you spend more money in making microgrids grid compatible, that in the longer term will result in savings because you will be able to reuse that distributed generation. And we have computer models that can be useful for some things. For example, to define those areas where the utility should just leave entrepreneurs to do the job. It could help establish regional electricity rates. So if we this reference electrification model, we come up with a, a necessary rate of 25 cents per kilowatt hour, for example, for a certain village. <laughs> that is something that tells the regulator what is, as, is admissible for a developer to charge. We can evaluate technologies in the design stage. So when you're deciding all the characteristics of a battery or the characteristics of a diesel generator, if you have this type of models, you can assess the performance on a, on a real application. We can compare business models in terms of, for example, if you have one model where maintenance is done in a certain way that can improve your economies of scale from grouping. We have some ways of representing those, those things in the model. And you can explain trade off situations between cost and quality of service to local population. Which are, it's, this is similar to the rate design part, which where you use a computer model to serve as a validated reference to have discussion. So you say, we run this tool, which is completely technology neutral. We came up with this price, and this is the quality you, you could get from that. So then let's have a conversation about like, how do you want to start like, climbing this energy access ladder. So thank you for your attention. I guess we can open the floor for more formal questions. Uh, just a question about the model at the end. Were you able to have that conversation with the energy operator, like the system operator there in that province? Like, what, what were they say about it? Like, right, we have had mixed results in that. In the in the case of Vaishali in in India, in that district, we have talked to North Bihar Power Distribution maybe like three or four times. Uh, we have been working with them. They have helped us to gather data and also to evaluate our assumptions and so on. And, and the conclusion we have arrived to for the case of Vaishali is that it's something that they already told us in the beginning, that Vaishali is a case where the grid is probably right now, even right now, uh, the best solution. We have had other conversations, for example, with a GIZ in, in Uganda. And we have been identifying sites, real sites for, for the deployment of microgrids. So what the Germans are going to do, we're thinking about doing, is using this model to create the terms of reference for a request for proposals. So that local entrepreneurs are going to bid and try to like, get some support from, from the Germans. But we're going to use this as a reference for what would be an efficient design. So that will be the first experience of having that negotiation with someone who is actually implementing this. We are also working on a couple of pilots in Vaishali, in places that we know that at some point the grid will be a best solution, but more to experiment with this grid compatible microgrid idea. And, and in that case, we also expect to go, go in, 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 in that conversation. This is a heavily subsidized uh, pilot, but will prove this grid compatibility cost structure and will also allow us to go and have those conversations, even, even though the grid is going to get there maybe in two, three years. Yeah. Hi, I'm trying to get a sense of how uh, difficult it is to use the uh, reference electrification module. Can you give me just a quick uh, breakdown of the inputs that I would need to have to design a microgrid? For, for the, single, for the single, single system, for one system? Or for a large area? Uh, well, let's start with one system, maybe, and another scaling up to a okay, region, so for example. You need the location of the buildings. You need to define building types. You go there, you find out like what type of appliances people could have. From that, you need to fill out the spreadsheet that we have, which is the one I was showing to you. 
here. So this is the description of the users, what appliances they would have. You need an, a catalog of equipment of the electric equipment that is available to a utility in that place, the types of wire, types of transformers, and so on. You need a catalog of the generation technology that is available, characteristics of the bed. So you can use the default things that we have in the model. We have some a catalog of solar panels and batteries and diesel generators there, or you can use the, the ones there, or just change the cost, the cost figures. So for your case study, how long did it take you to get all this information for the region in India that you looked at? For the large region? Yes. Yeah, that took us, so for, for, Vaishali, for the Vaishali case, it took us maybe six months to get enough information to be able to run it, which involved getting this paper map, digitizing all the lines, verifying that information with a local engineer, and, and so on. Most of what we have out demand comes from our very limited samples. We haven't done this in a like, consulting professional way. In that case, you would have a much larger sample of buildings to create your base consumer. And also the same is true for the network equipment. So we validated some of our assumptions with the, with the local utility, but we are using some components that are more similar to what you use in Europe than, than, than in India. You can set up, in the state that the mall is now, if you want to use our existing catalogs and you have the location of the buildings and the types of the buildings, you could be running a case in, in a week. Like this is the time it would take you to have a, like a reasonable data set that you just put into a model and, and, and it runs. We're doing this like for Colombia now and for Kenya and for a couple of sites too. Thank you. We're running out of time, so any, any further questions? I just have one quick question and, and comment. The first one is, seems like you require a lot of data for this to give you some sort of reliable results, right? And the right. second one is how, and the second one is how is the, what was mentioned before, how are the po policies or other policies, political issues you can include in these, which you mentioned you're trying to do, but. Right, so what we realize is that what we want now is to create something, create a model that is useful given the way politics happen. So this is meant to be not a policy calculator tool or something that you can encode policies into, but something that can be used by policymakers or by regulators to design policy or set send bench benchmarks. So we, we don't think that is convenient or accurate to try to encode policy into the model itself. But there's some cases where you can do that. For example, if, you, if your policy is no diesel in, in a certain region, you can exclude that from the solution. You can say, get minimum cost, but subject to no diesel. Or if you think yeah, that you're going to- Referring to the example that Professor Keshev was saying, which is- Maybe, maybe pay. One more, uh, just a little bit more. I mean, there is the issue of land acquisition for the transmission lines. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing from talking to the utilities is that they, at least in Bihar, they have been able to execute their plans. So there's like many obstacles like in, in any part of the world. But, but in the end, they have been making progress to, to our surprise. In the beginning, we, we were told, no, they say that they are going to connect everyone to grid, but in reality, it will be 50 years until they start connecting people. But they have been making progress. They have been one of the things that I think is important, they have been digitizing more information. Now they know where different assets are. They know which transformers are in good condition or in bad condition. So the utility, the grid extension is being done in a much better way than when I think it was done like maybe even five or 10 years ago. Yeah, but the quality of your results depends on the data, right? Right. How, how much you're able to collect. Otherwise you end up with fictitious answers. So right? let me go to the, this block diagram that I had here. Let's put it to the, here. Okay, so this is the, the database. I have some boxes in green lines 
which is related to things that are optional. There's also some things that you don't have and you can guess. For example, in many cases, we don't even have the location of the, of the houses. Mm -hmm. So we guess the location of the houses. We guess whether they are electrified or not electrified. We guess how much they would consume. Um, for those situations, the value, the value you can get from this model is to test for robustness of solutions. So if you move your demand assumption up and down by 50%, and you still get an off-grid site. Mm -hmm. If you move grid reliability up and down by 50% and you still get an off-grid site, that you can consider is a safe place to go and do microgrids. And then you can go to a site, find out more about that specific site, and run the model now with more information. A good feature is that the, the model itself is, is the same, only that you can shortcut inference steps with actual information that you can have. Sure. If you know for real, you just put more information, and the more you put, the better, the, more, the, the better the results you're going to obtain. Well, one last question, if anybody has a last question. If not, I'd like to thank uh, Claudio again. Thanks for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.